out of the box ideas for Hawaii tax and economics with the tax attorney of longstanding, Roger Epstein, who joins us here on Community Matters on Think Tech. Welcome to the show, Roger. Hi, Jay. Always great to have a conversation with you. Absolutely. So you were making my heart go faster before the show because you were describing your reasons for being interested in all this and how life has changed in, in the course of our careers and our lives on the planet. And I hope you can repeat that. Yes. So uh, ha having grown up like you in the 50s and 60s, gone to college and law school in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, uh, I have seen the changes of $200 to go to college at the University of Maryland. That was my total tuition, about $1,500 a year to go to Georgetown Law School. Got out, I could make $10,000 and buy a house for $15,000. Uh, and uh, just a whole ability to live what we used to call the American dream, of uh, working hard, getting an education, either or both, and uh, having a, a, a good middle-class life. Uh, that has all gone out the window since, uh, literally since the right wing, the Republicans came with this idea that a government is bad. What did Reagan say? It's not the answer, it's the problem. And that trickle-down economics, what's good for General Motors is good for the country, has turned us into a situation uh, where uh, the one percent of the country, or 700 people, own more than half of the wealth of the bottom half of the country. And college uh, that I spent $200 on is now 15,000. If you get out of school today, uh, out of the University of Hawaii, and you get a job making $35,000 a year. Uh, and you can't buy a house for 150% of that. You can't even buy a condominium for 10 times that, much less a house for uh, maybe a starter house you can get for six or 700,000. So what's that? 20 times your income if you can get a decent job. So I give up on the feds. We're too far away from it. Uh, there's the, the, you know, the Congress has been dysfunctional for over 20 years. But Hawaii is really in a unique position for many reasons to be able to do some what you and I have chosen to call for this program out of the box ideas, completely consistent with our capitalist framework. I'm not talking about revolutions. I'm not talking about uh, over becoming a socialist government even. I'm just talking about a community that where the people here who live in paradise, who live in a fabulous place, can have a decent economic life here too, instead of simply inviting the wealthiest people in the world to come here and let outside corporations own the hotels and the tourist industries and make all the money. And uh, so that's the thesis that we could take back Hawaii in a very appropriately uh, uh, political way. We don't have to change anything. We just have to make a decision that our community is basically for the people who live here. Oh my God, you have my, you have my attention, Roger. I am all ears. Okay, so I have about eight ideas um, for living wages, affordable houses, significant sustainable agriculture, and meeting better community needs uh, with revenue uh, uh, to benefit, uh, uh, revenue in the form of taxes to benefit our people here. So uh, let me start with uh, this one. I, I, I have a list that I sent to you, Jay, and I'm going to kind of go through that. So the first one has to do with agriculture. So uh, uh, I, I, I uh, invoked the name of one of my great uh, heroes and friends, Ramsey Tom. Uh, he's come up with a plan years ago, and I know many people have talked about this and we haven't implemented, but called a, a, a Konahiki organization. So in the old days, uh, you had the Ahupua'a, the Konahiki was in charge of it, people who wanted to come 
and farm on a, uh, on that pie shaped wedge going to the ocean from the mountains could simply uh, reach an agreement on vacant land, start their uh, farm and uh, uh, grow uh, agriculture and then share it with the community. So here we could take land that uh, there's lots of land here to grow vegetables. Uh, y and I used to be the bread belt of uh, uh, Oahu. Uh, not to mention the Central Plateau, which now we're going to build a housing development bigger than Hawaii Kai instead of agriculture. But the concept here would be to have a, a, a shared infrastructure, a shared uh, 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 cost of uh, everything it takes to become a farmer uh, and to farm the land. And we would have the Konahiki. Uh, be the owner in some fashion, whether it was uh, Kamehameha Schools land, whether it was state land, whether it was private owner's land, that we would refuse to re, uh, uh, rezone as housing developments. You know, the, the, the uh, housing into the ownership of land is just hold on long enough and keep pounding away at the state and you don't have to make agriculture, you don't have to grow anything, all you do is wait and you can turn it into a housing development and you're a lot better off. So let's not do that. So the idea with the Konahiki would be you take big tracts of land, you know, Dole is selling all their land up there. Some of that may be poison with uh, pesticides, but you could straighten that out. We could buy a lot of Dole land, the community could work out together, with the banks who have to missions. Anyway, you put together philanthropy, government, uh, banking, uh, uh, and, and private investors. You, you, you buy big tranches of land and you have it owned communally. And then a farmer, uh, and there's lots of people who like to be farmers. I'm told that on five acres of land, you could make $100,000 a year net profit, uh, some, depending on what you grow, of course, some times ago. So, the concept is the Konahiki builds out the infrastructure, uh, the farmer gets a, 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 a lease and they farm the land and share the profits uh, as a rental for the property. And you can't build a house on it. You can't live on this property. It's agriculture. These are not for gentlemen farmers like most of our ag zone lands are. This is agricultural land that you have a lease to farm You'll have to drive from your house or live close by, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not. And if you, you know, maybe you put up a shed or something or put on a, a something you can sleep overnight. But that's the concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail. This, no, but do, do go into details about what, what kind of legislation you need to do this. Uh, first of all, um, it sounds like you'd have to bring a bunch of um, institutions, organizations, business organizations together, okay? Yeah. Um, to make the investment in the Konahiki, in the, in the commune. And then, of course, you'd have to figure out what the terms of that communal ownership are. Um, and that wouldn't be easy. You'd have to come up with a kind of a new approach to condominium, essentially, to write a, a horizontal property regime, essentially. Um, for how it is managed and who has what rights and obligations. But you know, what do you have they, to do? Yeah, they, I, I, all these things can be mapped out. Yes, it's going to take the will of the community. You're going to need the government. You're going to need the banks. You're going to need the Hawaii Community <laughs> Foundation and other philanthropists. You're going to need OHA. Uh, you're going to need um, uh, 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 Kamehameha Schools. Do we, are we a community? Can we bring this kind of will uh, to bear? And I don't think you're going to need legislation. I ah. think you're just going to need the community to get together ah. and say, this is what we plan to do. And in the 50 years I've lived in this state, the biggest problem I hear from everybody, we have enormous talent. We have enormous uh, possibilities. We cannot bring ourselves to act together as a group. There are only a million people uh, on Oahu. Uh, 
uh, you know, the, g getting together should be not that difficult. Well, you need a leader. Yeah, you, you have to have a leader who's willing to sacrifice and be a leader. You know, it ain't it ain't pretty sometimes, and you have yeah. to have followers. <clears throat> you have to have followers who commit to following the leader, and that's I right. guess that means a political leader because that's how you get selected as a leader for a large project. Am, am I right about that? I think so, and I think you whoever becomes the next governor. Uh, uh, could uh, appoint the lieutenant governor for this, uh, uh, could take the reins themselves if they really wanted to, could get, but it's got to be a, a full on, yeah, let's do this because this is our lives and our kids' lives and the next generation. And Hawaii is, uh, uh, we have the largest per capita homeless problem. I've been to meeting after meeting and nobody does anything but talk about it, it seems to me. I mean, Dwayne Carissu did a nice project, but what was that, 50 people or 30? We've got to tackle these problems as if we really mean it, Jay. And okay, so you're, you're shifting gears now. You're into another out-of-box so solution. You're talking about um, homelessness. Uh, you're talking about yeah, building. Okay, so, building so agriculture. So I'm trying to put together a package of ideas that could be taken on uh, by this, uh, you know, there's an executive council now that's been the top 50 companies that now is trying to solve problems in Hawaii. And, and, and if we try to solve them piecemeal, we're going to end up with the same stuff. And this is not a simple uh, proposal. This is some ideas that would work and get us into a whole new place. What's your idea about uh, homelessness and, uh, and affordable housing? Okay, well, a couple ideas on homelessness and affordable housing. You're, you're uh, uh, taking me uh, off my uh, uh, list here. <laughs> it's my All job. Right. That's your job to get me out of here. All right. Well, uh, one thing we could do, first of all, uh, homelessness and affordable housing is not going to be solved by building new buildings, period. Uh, we've got affordable housing that in 20 years becomes unaffordable housing. It's limited. There is plenty of space in what we have now, and the pandemic has created substantial additional space, and other communities uh, are taking advantage of it. Downtown Honolulu is uh, uh, a vacant, vacant lot. You know, and it's not going to get any better. Uh, uh, so take the uh, uh, take these commercial buildings in downtown Honolulu, turn them into uh, studio apartments. The government could buy them at a at a fair market value price, and we could put people into that under some kind of standards. Now, there's different categories of homeless, houseless people. Uh, some of them are just missing a paycheck or two. Uh, some of them are completely incapable of taking care of themselves mentally or physically. Some of them are on drugs. Do you know we don't have a good drug rehabilitation in the state? If you go to jail and 80 percent of more of the people there have drug problems, we don't have a drug rehabilitation program. We, we just aren't tackling the problem. So so that would be one answer. Look for vacant space rather than starting to build new properties. And inherent in what you're saying is uh, um, it's rental. The model is rental instead of own your own home. Well, this is for houseless. Now, the next step, so that's houseless. That's what I'm saying. Look for spaces that could be turned into residences because brick and mortar commercial properties are going to continue to suffer because everybody's gotten into buying over the internet and because the big guys and the the Walmarts and the Targets and these kind of people are really stiff competition for mom and pops. Now, not everybody's going to be out of business, but a lot of them already are. And let's really take an inventory and try to utilize that space for a certain category. Uh, why did we close the Kaneohe uh, Sanitarium, health, uh, mental institution? I don't know. I'm sure uh, it had a lot of problems economically, et cetera. But we need a place for get people off the street. Some people need to be in an institution and it needs to be run in a way. I've heard IHS is, I mean, it's a wonderful place, 
but you go down there and 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 there's a lot of chaos and a lot of people don't want to be there so we we need to expand the 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 availability of that okay affordable housing okay here's where we get into a whole new out of the box concept housing is designed for uh, two purposes in our society one shelter two investment everybody knows that your house is your best investment but what we need is a shelter so rather than build new houses we create a program that uh, uh, is already very deeply um, uh, analyzed and vetted uh, which again uses a konahiki the konahiki company becomes a co-owner buys a property uh, anywhere on the island and buys it at whatever value they can they can get again the the funding for this is through loans from banks maybe uh, st state bonds philanthropy all this kind of stuff the konahiki buys the property and then find somebody, a good example would be somebody renting a house or an elder person who needs to uh, get money out of their own house. Uh, the property is sold to the Konahiki and then a person who has a, uh, 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 can't quite get into a place now and is renting, uh, puts up just a, a nominal amount, like 1% of the cost. So let me give you an example. Uh, condo costs $500,000. The Konahiki buys it for $500,000. Uh, Jay Fidel says, I want to uh, I want to be a, a co-owner. I want to own this property. Puts up 1%. The other 99% of the cost is borrowed. Instead of paying, so your down payment's only 1%, but you get a little skin in the game. Uh, uh, the the mortgage you just pay interest only you don't amortize the principal so you can work this out so that the cost is less than the rental cost the numbers show you could buy a place and own it and you're an owner in a in a way very similar maybe a little bit less than the cooperative owner or a condo owner but you have all the rights of the use of your place you can uh, uh, bequest it to your kids. You can redo whatever you want within the context of the co-op homeowners rules or the condo homeowner, similar kind of thing. Money is put up in case a certain people, uh, as somebody defaults. But let's say we, we bought 10,000 to start. We go out and buy 10,000 units. People, all right, everybody can get in for 1%. And uh, so these are not, these are working people who are making money. They're not out on the streets, but instead of renting and worrying about whether your landlord is going to have his kid move in or raise the rent every year, you just pay the interest. So now you've got to paying about what you pay on a rental. And, uh, and if you decide that you want to leave and move to something else, you only get out of it the 1% you put in. If the house is now worth a million, then the Konahiki uh, buys it, or or you get your share of whatever you put into the equity. The Konahiki resells it for five hundred thousand dollars, and instead of losing affordable housing over time, you gain really affordable housing over time because now twenty years later, when this guy dies with no children or decides he wants to move to Arizona. He gets his only back and the house is still worth $500,000 for the new purchaser. Now we're building an inventory of affordable houses instead of going out and using up all our valuable land that we have so little precious little left. Uh, we create uh, uh, affordable housing forever and it gets better rather than worse as the value of the houses go up. It becomes that much better. So how does it, where does the money come from? The okay. money to buy these ten thousand units. Okay, so it's basically going to be loan capital, uh, 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 bank loans that are guaranteed, perhaps by the state, uh, just like a state bond would be. Uh, uh, banks are required to have community investment funds. 
uh, we might use some of that. There's philanthropy. And you can build in a, a, a small profit if a private investor would put in some money. They could make a couple of percent, which is more than they're getting now. Uh, you put your money in the bank, you get like point, you know, point one two percent interest. You know, I think I got a hundred thousand dollars in something that I just made three bucks on last uh, last year. <laughs> you know, so so uh, you could even make it attractive for private. Again, this is not something we're going to do tomorrow. But if we don't start getting it in place, we don't start thinking about these things, Jay, then we're going to have more and more issues. It isn't getting any better. No, it's not. It's going to get worse. And the U.S. dollar is going to go out of uh, use in 10, 20 years, 50 years. Uh, we got to be thinking ahead. We got to be thinking of the future. Well, let, me, let me turn you to one other uh, issue that you and I discussed briefly before the show began, and that is the management of uh, offshore investment. Uh, so I come around, I want to buy a shopping center, uh, I, you know, I want to do condo, and, you know. Um, and the question is, uh, um, uh, I say, say I want to do a shopping center with a lot of retail. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, uh, how do you how do you tax me? How do you tax those retailers? Uh, right now, we have a REIT situation with a REITs buy it all. There's been a bill in the ledge for a long time that hasn't passed yet that would that would tax the REITs. Right now, um, the tax is imposed on the owners on the mainland, um, but it is not imposed here. And the result is a lot of money that we could tax is not being taxed. Um, yes. You, you have thoughts you about right. that? Yeah. Let me do the read first. Uh, uh, I was very instrumental in uh, uh, designing a bill for uh, taxing REITs. Uh, uh, the, as you said, the trick with REITs is they don't pay any tax themselves, not like other corporations. And we have it, my last count, we had $20 billion worth of REIT investments, including the Alamoana Shopping Center, the Hilton Hawaiian Village, Pearl City. Uh, I mean, a lot of trophy properties, if you will. Uh, uh, the, the, the bill that's in the legislature now would simply eliminate uh, the tax exemption. So make a tax at the corporate level, which changes the nature of REITs because they're supposed to be like everybody can put in $1,000 and, and be a real estate investor. And mutual funds, it's a mutual fund for real estate. And mutual funds don't pay tax, only the shareholders do. So I just, the other day, uh, uh, submitted a bill uh, to uh, several of our legislative people who asked me for it, one that I proposed two or three years ago, which has a withholding on the distributions to everybody, out-of-state or in-state people, of Hawaii tax. So if the Hawaii tax is 6% for corporations, then uh, the, the, uh, your distribution of $100 as a REIT shareholder, you get 94, the state of Hawaii gets six. Just like every time you get a paycheck, you get uh, 94 and the state of Hawaii gets six and the federal government gets 15, whatever it is. Withholding is so common. And it's a, it's a tax at the end of the day. You know, it's withheld, but it's realized as a tax, right? Well, the, yes. And when you go when you go to pay your taxes in California, you say, I already paid 6% to Hawaii, and California gives you a credit. So there's no difference to the REITs or even to their, their shareholders, uh, except if you live in Nevada, where you don't have to pay any tax. But if you live in Nevada and you buy a real estate property, you're directly in Hawaii, you got to pay Hawaii tax. And real estate, of course, is something where the advantages that the government give you are entirely clear. Police, fire departments, roads, sewers, water, electricity. Absolutely. Good point. We're, we're paying for all these benefits and we're getting nothing from uh, the $20 billion is making a billion dollars a year. We're losing $60 million in revenue because it's too complicated for the legislature uh, to understand that withholding is a very simple methodology. Uh, I've even spoken with people at the Multi-State Tax Commission 
they believe that this is, or I don't, not everybody, but a couple of technical people, not the political people, technical people say, that makes a lot of sense, Roger. This is what the federal government does for REITs. Uh, they give you a break too. And, but if you're an American, you pay your own income tax as a shareholder. If you're a foreigner, the federal government requires the REITs to withhold, I forgot what the number is, 10%, 30% of the distribution to a foreigner and turn it over to the federal government as the foreigner's payment of US taxes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it flies away on little wings. Which is where our money's going. It's flying away to New York and California and Florida and places that aren't providing the services that we're providing. So that's number one. That read is a good thing, and it's could it could be passed this year. We passed a, a bill several years ago, which uh, actually just created the tax at the REIT level because the withholding was too complicated, and it passed unanimously by the legislature. and Governor Ige vetoed it because he was afraid we weren't going to get investment by REITs. But I tell you, what do we care if we get investment by REITs? They're not building any things. They're not creating, they're just owning properties. If they don't want to own it because they got to pay a tax, then sell it to somebody else who will own it. I, I've, I've had so many people come to me looking for investments in Hawaii over the years, people in Asia, people on the continent, uh, you know, practicing uh, uh, tax law. I've just met a lot of people and internationally, and uh, we could get so much investment in a state, it's not funny. And people are looking for deals here and you can't find it. And why do we give a break? And why do we lose $60 million in tax a year? Uh, because the REITs don't want to change. Nobody- well, the, REITs, the REITs opposed legislation the like REITs this. REITs opposed they? everything. At first they started saying, well, look, we're already paying real property taxes and general excise tax. And I said, well, next time I file my income tax return, I'm going to put on there. I don't have to pay income taxes because I paid uh, general excise tax. And, <laughs> see and how far you get with out. that. <laughs> yeah, see how far. All right. Let me, let me, let me go on. I got some outer, outer, outer boxes. All right. So I've seen, since I came in 1972, the price of hotels go from like $50 million to $850 million. So, so why is that? And who's making the money on that? I'm not, I'm, I'm not, this is not anti-capitalist. You're entitled to make money. I've been, done real estate deals. I've had lots of clients. It's the degree, Jay. It's the degree of how much the capital is getting, how much the real estate is getting, and how much the people working are getting. And, and that, just as an example, when talking back in the 60s, a guy on a factory floor or working, was making 30 to, well, uh, the, the president was making 30 or 40 times what the guy on the floor is making. Today, it's four or 500 times. Okay, so you take, you create a new tax, you call it a wealth tax or a value tax. It doesn't have to be a real estate tax because that's left to the counties. But the state creates a new kind of tax based on the value of, of, of your property. And, it, and, and you tax, Let's say you tax the Hilton Hawaiian Village $10 million with this tax. You give them a credit for every dollar they spend on a livable wage for their employees. Not a simple calculation. A lot of ways I can see all kinds of loopholes and things, but that's the concept. You can pay the tax and give the government enough to, to uh, give free services to people starving on the street and buy these units for housing people, or you can pay your own employees a livable wage so that they don't end up on the street or work in four different jobs, both them and their wives, two or three jobs, literally, to make the bills, make the ends meet. So, so that's, that's a, another one I like. This is a tax on the owner of what? Real estate? Tax or? on the owner of, it could be that shopping center you're talking about, but what I'm really thinking about is uh, the, the hotels. But I think shopping centers are, could be in the same category and people have to be paid a livable wage. But uh, what happens when the, when the hotel pays more uh, money, when it pays more salaries, its value goes down. 
So now we're lowering the value, no question. We're lowering the value of this real estate, but we're making it closer to that 30 to 40 times that it used to be instead of four to 500 times. And we're having it participate in the civic process here, um, sort of pay its dues um, to, the, uh, to the community. You know, why do people come to Hawaii? Because we got a, a Hilton Hotel? Yeah, that, it's nice that there's Hilton Hotels everywhere. They come to Hawaii for the beach, which is uh, publicly owned up to the vegetation line, and for the ocean and the sun, none of which belongs to the hotel owner. It belongs to us, if it belongs to anybody. And, and, uh, and so that's my thinking, that the wealth has to be shared in some way, and that it's not unreasonable uh, to, to, to force people who, real estate is a risky business. Anytime you talk to somebody and say, well, how come you made so much on real? Well, it was risky. I could have lost money. Well, Maybe you're going to lose some money. I don't want to put anybody out of business. I don't want to see them go bankrupt. But I do think that the fact that the value of their hotel went up 10 or 15 times in the last 20, 30, 40 years, and their workers who used to make a decent living now have to have other jobs just to, uh, and they can't buy a house, but just to rent a place and uh, have their kids have food on the table. So Okay. I really well, like that one, Roger. We have time for one more. You got one more for us? I got lots more. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's one. How about uh, government money? Uh, we print some Hawaii uh, money. Uh, it can't be called money, but it could be uh, Hawaii kingdom dollars. It could be. Uh, and two things we do with this money. First of all, the state could get services. You want to get a contra outside contractor, you pay them with Hawaii bills. If the, if the, uh, and there are other cities and communities in the United States that have their own money and have doing it, been doing it for a long time. So this is not entirely new. Now the state doesn't have to raise taxes to get the money because all they got to do is print more money. And then they agree that the money that they printed can be used by the, the, the service provider to pay their taxes. Now, now, as long as the state says you can use it to pay your taxes and other state obligations, the community uh, shopkeepers will begin to accept it. And so we've created a whole internal currency. The money's not gonna leave the state. And the government now has additional funds rather than raise taxes to do these community services that we need. So who's backing these dollars? Who's going to pay off when these dollars are presented for American money? No, you can't change it for American money. Cannot do that. Well, it's the illegal. state the state receives the state will take its own dollars back and use it for any obligations including your taxes to the state. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, the federal government will not take it. It's not intended to be an exchange of currency for federal currency. That's illegal. But if the state prints, you know, with, a, with that image of the king on the dollar and it will take the money, then other places have shown that, that uh, stores and uh, service providers in the state will take the money. And then it becomes an internal kind of currency that again, if you take a dollar and you buy something with it, it, it multiplies like 10 or 15 times. The shopkeeper pays his employees, he buys some more, so all this. But if you put it out of state, Jay, because it's gone to Walmart who ships all their money out of state, uh, then you only get one time instead of 15 times. Yep. And, and not only that, this will help promote uh, uh, local business. Sure it will. And, and furthermore, tourists who come here and, and, and buy these uh, Hawaii, Hawaii dollars, uh, we'll, we'll see it as a souvenir item. See it as a souvenir? Back and never try to pass it in any context. There you go. Or they could use it to buy, you know, Hawaiian cookies or whatever they want. So you know, it, it, this reminds me 
of uh, Hawaii currency during the war. Are you, are you familiar with what happened? I'm not, but I'm, I, I have some vague idea that this kind of thing has been done previously, and I am aware that it's being done in several locations now within the country. Special, special dollars, American dollars, U.S. dollars were issued with a stamp on it for use in Hawaii only during the war. They didn't, they didn't want a cash flow out of here. They thought it was a matter of national security. So you could pass these dollars. You could not pass regular American dollars. Uh, you, had, you had to trade them in. And at the end of the war, they bought them back from you. Um, this is very interesting, and it has it has a, a historical root somehow to have special dollars that are that are only available in Hawaii, um, and those those are collector items right now. I tell you. Anyway, one more. Let's do one more, and then we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I got one more. You know, Jay, I sent you this list. I'm happy to work with you. Anybody you think we could uh, uh, get together. Uh, to do this. Okay, here's a, here's a, I'm going to tie two together. Uh, uh, volunteerism. Okay. Uh, there's only two things that generate revenue, time and money. And so money is fungible. And uh, it's also very inflationary. I remember when I worked for the federal government years ago, uh, when uh, in DC, everybody worked for the federal government. When the government announced a, 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 a X percent rate, they announced the, a raise for the government workers. The parking lot raised its fees by a dollar the next day. They didn't even wait to, <laughs> until it was implemented. Opportunism. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, so dollars are inflationary, but an hour of your time is an hour of your time. And we're, we're in a situation where people are living longer, uh, they're retiring. Uh, we're in a community. Uh, we could just create more meaningful ways of uh, uh, volunteerism. You could even volunteer for government jobs. How many times have you gone to the, uh, get your car license or whatever, your registration, and had to wait in line and say, what? And there's two empty spots where people are out to lunch or whatever. There's no reason why a volunteer couldn't be sworn to secrecy the same way those uh, paid workers are. And you go in there and you learn the job and you do the routine stuff, but it's meaningful and it's helpful. And I'm not saying there's there's thousands of opportunities. How does it work? How does it work? So you, you the, let's say for the government. All right. The government creates a whole plan and makes it known through advertisements, through all, you know, through media, uh, that uh, these positions are open for volunteerism, and they and they have to have work with the people in the government to accept volunteers. There's no pay, no pay. It's volunteer, but you're working. You're you're putting in four hours, six hours, eight hours a week to help your community have better services, including you. Uh, and of course, you could do it at hospitals, which already do it, but you could just expand the programs everywhere to make volunteerism a kind of a, hey, I'm retired, but I'm still going to put in one day, eight hours, 10 hours uh, in some capacity. But you have to make it meaningful. If it's just BS and people are sitting around, it's not going to do any good. Yeah, no, I love that idea. And if you had a structure, if you had an organizational structure, implicitly you'd have recognition of the time and effort and yes. contribution yes. that individual you makes. To. You could go on a website and you could see what your hours are, how many, and what your neighbor and everybody else put in. And then you could celebrate him or her. Yeah. You know, you could give him awards. Um, you could incentivize them in so many non-monetary ways. But you know, uh, the main it, thing is, the main thing, Jay, is aloha. The main thing is aloha. And uh, there's so many people uh, retired and more coming who are going to be, who are going to, in fact, those people are going to need more volunteerism. Uh, but there are people who are going to be capable for working 15, 20 years after they retire. And, and, and let's, let's put out a way, let's create a system to have meaningful volunteerism be your Aloha citizenship opportunity. 
Yeah, and you know, it gives you an identity. It gives you a cause in life. It gives you a purpose in your retired years. It'll it'll help you live a better quality of life and longer. And exactly. um, to have to to know that you are making contribution to the community as a volunteer. There's a purity there. Roger, what a perfect out of the box solution to end our program with. Uh, let me say that I, I know you have others we haven't discussed. Uh, we could do that uh, again. And uh, we could also bring in, as you suggested, someone else, maybe another uh, attorney or accountant or just an ordinary business person and bat these other things around. So don't or leave let's town. You and I, let's you and I sit down and flesh out some more of these ideas. We'll get, uh, uh, I mentioned Ramsey Tom. I'm going to put him on the spot if uh, anyone he knows should be listening to this program. Uh, but And I have other people, I think. But we're not the only ones doing this. But this stuff is out of the box. And again, are we competing? Are we? Let's take our ideas and their ideas and uh, and see if we can all come together and come up with a holistic plan for making Hawaii a wonderful place to live that it, it deserves to be. Roger Epstein, we'd love to have you on the program. We'll do this again soon. Thank you so much for coming down. You're welcome, Jay. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Aloha. Aloha.